All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining us um, with your IPG reps uh, for our Pride Month favorites for our indie booksellers. Um, I'm Amy Despinet. I am the Eastern Trade Sales Rep. And also with us are Brianna, who is the Western Trade Sales Rep, and Travis, who covers the Central U.S. So we have for you today a selection of some of our favorites that we think would be great recommendations for your store for Pride Month. But really, just these are great books, and they would be welcome in your stores any time of the year. But uh, they are especially well suited for Pride Month. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll over to our next slide. And I'll let Brianna take over. So Travis and I will be at Children's Institute in two weeks. Um, we are both very excited to be there. And we will be at Meet the Presses and at the Rep Picks Speed Dating. So you will get to see us talk about a lot of books in a very short amount of time. And one of our publishers who has a lot of children's books, Wonder House, will also have their own table at Meet the Presses. So we'll have a lot of their titles there that you can get familiar with. But we look forward to meeting all of you there. Oh, I'm jealous. I can't go. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a great time. We'll send you pictures. Oh, yeah, that'll help. Um, no, I hope you do. <laughs> All right. Um, we wanted to also take this time to tell you about a book that is publishing in on June 25th. Um, this is Finding Your Third Place. Uh, this is from Fulcrum Publishing, and it is one of our top shelf titles for the summer. Um, but this is all about the idea of taking pride in being a third place. I know um, as booksellers, as indie booksellers, um, many of our places are already third places in our communities, which is fantastic. And the author of this, Richard Kite, is doing a great job of combining storytelling, social science, and philosophy to explore the importance and value of third places, as well as how we can find and cultivate them. Essentially, like best practices for how you can best optimize your store to be a third place. Um, I've been presenting this already on some of my sales calls, and I've been really pleased to see that a lot of my accounts are taking multiple copies, like 10, 12 copies or more, which has been great to see because I think this is an excellent title, um, not only to kind of show off what the hard work that you do and what um, what a cornerstone you are within your communities, but it's also a way to help others who are looking to find ways to support third places and to cultivate additional third places within the community. I mean, I think the more the merrier. Um, Fulcrum Publishing is starting a movement with this title. Um, they have a um, third place pledge that you can take. It's super easy and I guarantee you're already doing what's on the third place pledge. Um, and with that, uh, once you've completed that pledge, you'll receive from Fulcrum a window decal that says find your third place here. So that's a great way to identify your store as a third place. Um, and I think, do we have the link to that for more information yeah. in the chat? Yeah, I just uh, dropped the link to um, sign up to be a third place. Awesome. So this one, and this one also, I'll just say, it's it's kind of um, almost like a, a pamphlet or a call to action. Like it's a, it's a book, but it's slim. It's a quick read. And I do think it's very helpful, a very helpful look at, um, you know, just how we can be a place of community. Yeah, I think... Uh... Grace had a question, how are we defining third place? Um, they define it in this book as, you know, work is, or home is your first place, work or school is your second place, and third is, your third place is where you'll find community. So um, basically wherever you go when you're not at home to be around people, to um, create that community that doesn't necessarily involve work or school. Right. Any other questions? Okay, I'll move ahead to the next one. Yeah, and we also wanted to highlight some of the books that we distributed uh, that were nominated for the Lambda Awards this year. Uh, we have three. Um, 
right now we've got uh, Crying Wolf by Eden Boudreau. This is from Book Hug Press, and this was nominated uh, in the bisexual nonfiction category. Heart Drive by Paul Stevenson is um, a collection of poetry that's from Carcanet Press, and that was nominated, as I said, in Gay Poetry, and then Reaching 90 by historian Martin Duberman. This comes uh, from CRP, Chicago Review Press, and this was nominated in the Gay Memoir slash Biography section. Um, these awards are going to be announced on the 11th of June, and we wish all three authors and books uh, the best luck. Yes. All right. And then um, before we head into our um, titles that we'll be presenting for you today, we just wanted to give you a quick reminder of the rep specials that we have um, available to you for these summer months. Um, we do have a top shelf special with um, uh, where you have a $200 net minimum order of any combination of summer 2024 top shelf titles and we'll receive a plus 5% discount. The front list special, um, 150 net minimum of summer front list titles will receive a plus 3% discount. And the back list special, uh, $150 net minimum of a sort of back list title. So this is really anything that's um, 2023 or prep earlier, and that will also receive a plus 3% discount. Um, if you have questions about these, um, we're, we're always happy to answer any questions about when you can use them, how to use them. Um, and making sure your orders, you know, how to make them qualify. So with that being said, we will dive right in. I'm going to stop my share for a second and join and then add in our, um, our Edelweiss collection. And I think our Edelweiss collection was shared in the, um, when we sent out the initial invite, but we can drop it in the chat as well if you're, if you want to follow along on your own screen. Thanks, Brianna. <laughs> okay. All right. And up first, I think this is one of Brianna's recommendations. Yes. So the Meister of Decimon City from TamCat. It's the paperback edition, and it has received starred reviews from Library Journal, Booklist, and Publishers Weekly. This book reads like a superhero comic book in novel form, where a super genius and quasi-villain must stop her definitely a villain brother from taking over the world. And so while all that is going on, though, it has a delightfully queer cast of characters. Um, some people who are confident in their identity, some people who are still figuring it out. And one of the things I really love throughout this is that there's a really strong um, thread woven throughout of the main character realizing that she's asexual. She hears an offhand comment from someone else and says, wait, what does that word mean? And so it then kind of becomes a quest where as she's going along trying to take care of her clone dinosaurs and stop her brother and not be labeled a supervillain, she's trying to figure out that this label actually defines how she has felt for her entire life. So I really like that that is woven throughout as she is discovering that she's ace and that really becomes a big part of the story. Yeah, I think this one's super fun. I've been recommending it a lot to my accounts as well. Um, all right, next up is one of my recommendations. Uh, this is Sunburn. Um, from Verve Books, which is from Old Castle. It is a um, coming of age novel set in rural Ireland in the 1990s. Um, but it is a queer love story. It has really lovely writing and it's a just tender look at first love and figuring yourself out. Um, Lucy, the main character, Lucy, is in a small rural. Uh, Irish town um, and she definitely is sort of dealing with the pressures and expectations of her family and of the town at large and also just society in the 90s in Ireland um, and she's not she's not quite sure you know she's close friends with her her good friend Martin and everyone kind of just assumes that uh, Lucy and Martin are headed to coupledom and to be um 
you know, married and wife and have children and all that. And Lucy's just not so sure that that's the right fit for her. And especially when her friend Susanna is just, she can't keep her eyes off of her. And she's, she kind of comes to real, Lucy comes to realize that, you know, maybe she even loves Susanna. And what does that mean? So it's, you know, really kind of looking at, again, figuring out who you are and trying to stay true to that. And kind of just as we all grow up in coming of age way of just figuring out where, what path do we take? What's the right one for us? Where, where are we going to be most happy? And how does that fit in with, you know, family and cultural expectations? Uh, this book was also shortlisted for the Nero Book Awards, um, which is a set of awards celebrating outstanding writing by authors living in UK and Ireland. Um, this one is, was shortlisted under the debut fiction category. Uh, I, cannot recommend this enough. Um, I really like how it ends. Um, it has a very, I won't give anything away, of course, but just a really satisfying, hopeful note is how it ends. And um, I will just briefly give you a heads up in terms, if this is of interest to you, we are temporarily out of stock with this title, but it is on order and back stock is expected or new stock is expected to arrive in very early June. So I think this is one that's still possible to be in time for Pride Month. Um, but again, I think this is just an excellent, excellent story for any time of the year. Next we have Disobedience. Yeah, this is one of mine. Um, this is Disobedience and this is published by Book Hug Press. This uh, just came out, I think, last week, and this is literary dystopian queer slash trans fiction set in a post-apocalyptic world in the somewhat distant future, uh, written by poet and playwright Daniel Sarah Karasik. Uh, Book Hug has also published a collection of their poetry and one of their plays, which should be in the comps. Uh, the narrative centers on this character, Shale, who is a trans feminine person or a between in the language of the novel. Um, they were born and grew up in a vast prison complex that's controlled by a corporation. Every aspect of their life is brutally regimented by that corporation. Um, they're not allowed to be out as the person that they are or to have a public relationship, but they do have a secret lover named Ko, who is a resistance fighter, and he works to get Shale out of the prison, um, and they Shale ends up in a settlement camp called Riverwish, and that's where the majority of the action takes place. I really enjoyed reading this. Um, at its heart, this is a book about kind of building a queer utopia. It's about setting up a new community that runs counter to the world of the prison that a lot of the characters just escaped from. Um, it asks some really intriguing questions, like how do you set up a system of restorative justice in a place where conflicting views exist? How do you deal with the aftermath of the trauma of living in uh, a prison? How do you resist attempts uh, at structuring society in a patriarchal way? How do you find freedom and community to live as your authentic self? And how do you construct a peaceful society in a time of war and conflict? Um, as I said, I really love this book. I think it would be perfect for readers interested in apocalyptic sci-fi, although I will say that that's kind of light in this, um, but also for readers of speculative fiction, uh, readers of literary fiction by queer and trans people, and um, anyone interested in issues of restorative justice. And that's that. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. All right. Then we've got up next, Queer Folk Tales. So this one is one of mine. This is from the History Press, which the History Press has a whole line of folk tales that are retold by professional storytellers. So this is a collection of queer folk tales as retold by a queer professional storyteller who actually got his start because he was a professional storyteller and realized that there weren't enough queer-friendly stories. 
So being told by queer storytellers. So he set out to put together a collection of them. And this is a really wide mix of styles of stories. So they try to avoid simple regendering of stories. And in here, you'll find something where it is the, you know, classic tale of Cinderella, but Cinderella likes to help her husband, the prince, try on her own gowns. Or you have the tale, the, uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, and, you know, there's mentions of Dorian's male and female lovers throughout. So it kind of like really spans the gamut of the kinds of stories. Um, some are classic myths that you've heard before. Some are brand new, rewritten. Some of them are contemporary. Each of them is prefaced by a little paragraph or two from the storyteller, either about what he wanted to change the story or where the inspiration came from, the themes he wants to bring out. But this is just a really lovely collection of stories. You can just breeze through it, fall in love with them. It's a lot of fun to read and you can very much hear the voice coming through from the storyteller. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice, goodness. All right, um, this one is one of mine. Uh, this is from Tokyo Pop, Why I Adopted My Husband. Uh, this is the true story. Um, so this is a nonfiction memoir, which you don't often see, or at least not as much in manga. And this is also, um, it is told in a way that is appropriate for younger audiences. Uh, Tokyo Pop has it at ages 13 and up. But I will say it is a, it is a grown up story in the sense of it's about um, a couple trying to find a way to have legal recognition as a couple in Japan um, since gay marriage is not allowed. So what happens in this, um, this um, Yuta Yagi, the author, he was officially adopted by his husband so they could have rights at hospitals and in death as a gay couple. This is a practice that was somewhat common in the U.S. as well until 2015 when marriage equality uh, took place. So this is unfortunately something that a lot of couples have had to use as a workaround uh, just so, you know, if th uh, their partner was, like I said, in the hospital, they could visit them or make medical decisions on their partner's behalf if their partner was unable to speak. It also helps with... Um, wills and estate transfers and things like that um so this story um depicts how these two men met and fell in love their life together for the last 20 years their struggle um to kind of communicate their relationship to their families um not only in terms of <laughs> that they were coming out as a gay couple but also the fact that they were adulting <laughs> that um, one was adopting the other. Um, it also kind of touches on their own anxieties about the future and how their coupledom will be seen and accepted, um, as well as their determination to live happily and carefree as any other married couple would, um, while they continue to strive for independence and equal rights. In a Japan that is changing, the cultural landscape is changing and evolving, but um, you know, still has these real limitations. So this is, I think, a really fascinating story. Um, I really like that it is a somewhat lighthearted way to see a, um, a couple's full story on a very serious issue. Um, this is, uh, this one, this came out last year, Why I Adopted My Husband, also from Tokyo Pop that came out last summer is um, at 30, I realized I had no gender, which I think I included in the comp comps for this title in this collection. And that one also is a nonfiction memoir looking at um, the idea of reaching adulthood and finally maybe better understanding uh, your identity and, se and sexuality. So I know I'm highlighting specifically um, why I adopted my husband, but I think both are just excellent looks at the realities of uh, queer people and how they um, are fighting for 
basic rights. Okay, this next one is mine. This is the Gaudi image from Muspel Press. Um, and this is a classic lost gay pre-Stonewall novel. It was published in 1958 in Paris by the Olympia Press to avoid prosecution for obscenity uh, because no U.S. publisher would take it on given a lot of the themes that it discusses. Um, and this is the first time it's been in print in over 30 years. It's set in the mid-1950s in New Orleans and follows Titania, also known as Thomas Schwartz, who is a drag queen and underground celebrity. Um, the narrative follows her and her group of friends, a lovable but louche cast of characters who populate the queer underground. Um, this is raunchy, it is fun, and it has just so many jaw-droppingly hilarious double entendres, like when she explains why she took the name Titania, it, I still think about how funny it is. Uh, but I'm not going to get into why. <laughs> Excuse me. A lot of the characters are small-time crooks, thieves, prostitutes, alcoholics, um, relegated to the underground since polite society made no room for openly queer people. Um, one reviewer described this as a mix between Tennessee Williams and Jean Genet, and I think that's really apt. Uh, Samuel R. Delaney blurbed it and said it was among the best gay novels of the 50s, and I think this shares a lot of affinities with uh, Delaney's book, uh, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Um, this is just a lot of fun, and it's been uh, kind of a joy to rediscover this. Uh, this was published, as I mentioned, by Muswell Press. They publish a lot of books in a similar vein to this one. Um, they have a small but fantastic list of LGBTQ titles, um, most notably Queer Life, Queer Love, Volumes 1 and 2. You might be familiar with those anthologies. This is the same publisher, and I wanted to highlight this because I don't think it's gotten as much attention as it deserves. Um, and I think this is just a fantastic slice-of-life novel that shows that queer people have always been around. Um, especially in the 50s. Okay, uh, this next one is uh, one of mine again. This is um, this was actually on our fall top shelf list last fall in 2023, but this is Queer Chameleon and Friends. So this is sort of a humor uh, comic or graphic book, but definitely comic or cartoons. Um, it is a vibrant and uplifting collection of comic illustrations about LGBTQ plus life um, for the community and beyond. The creator, uh, Amy, she, they are the behind the online sensation at Queer Chameleon um, that has like literally millions of followers, um, specifically um, the web, her web comic started in 2021 and it has a huge online following. Uh, the TikTok following is almost like 700,000. Uh, 24% of that number is based in the U.S. Um, Queer Chameleon has been featured in Upworthy and Bored Panda. Um, but for this particular book, um, Amy added in 60 new comics, as well as some additional uh, like well-known favorites from Queer Chameleon. Um, but what I really like about this is it's very insightful. It's very funny um, exploring aspects of, you know, existing in a world that isn't always designed for queer people. And it includes, you know, what you might consider silly questions or awkward, but maybe sometimes accurate cliches, uh, as well as to the trials and tribulations of coming out or choosing not to. Um, it covers areas um, breaking down, like there's an introduction from Amy, but it also has what the flag, which is actually looking at different flags and representation um, across the spectrum, uh, st st stories about coming out, um, the funny, but like I said, maybe true cliches, looking at beyond the binary. Um, it also includes some resources, but this one is just a lot of fun and you, like you can kind of see um you know it has how do you realize you were gay and then it's you know mik quiz results um it's 
like I said, very lighthearted and fun, but it does, I think, touch on real experiences. Um, she, the, Amy also explains that part of the reason why the it's a chameleon is because obviously chameleons can kind of change color and that's used to kind of as a defense mechanism or to blend in. But in her book, the chameleons are changing color to stand out and to kind of own their identity and their uniqueness. So this is just, again, fun, but also just very reaffirming. And I think very, um, I think very recognizable and relatable um, for a lot of people. Uh, so this one, uh, I highly recommend. Um, and I, I think it'll, I think it's a fun, a fun pick for um, a pride table in particular in your stores. So <clears throat> Call Me Esteban is from Sandorf Passage, which does a lot of literature and translation. And Call Me Esteban, I not only sat down and read it in one sitting, but no joke, immediately flipped back to the beginning and read it again. Um, it, I got a little stiff after a while, but it was very good. Um, but so Call Me Esteban, uh, is from a queer writer from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And so it was originally translated from Bosnian. Uh, this translation did win a, or it received a starred Publishers Weekly review. And it follows that nice blend between uh, nonfiction essays about the author's life, but also kind of fictionalized where it kind of blends the, the two, but it takes place in pre and post-war Sarajevo as the author is coming of age and grappling with the fact that she has never known her mother. Her mother passed away when she was born. And so throughout the book, as she just has these little vignettes talking about different aspects of her life, her mother is kind of this ghostly presence in the background that she's trying to reckon with and having imaginary conversations with. But she's also spending time talking to, going through imaginary conversations, like writing letters to Elizabeth Bishop. And there is a little surrealist chapter in which Franz Kafka shows up to her door and they have a conversation about the trial. And throughout all of this too, as she grows older and starts to learn more about herself and come into her own identity, she also realizes that she loves other women. And so it also becomes part of her living with her girlfriends, wondering how her mother would have taken them and ending with this really nice kind of coming full circle moment of her bringing her girlfriend to her mother's grave where they're cleaning it and she's kind of bringing it all full circle between this lost mother she's never had and this new life that she's built. So the entire thing is just tender and aching and thoughtful, but also just kind of gutting emotionally. And it is a, a quick read in length, but a, a deep read as evidenced by the fact that I then read it a second time, but I did deeply love this one. That one sounds cool, Brianna. Um, this next one is for me. Uh, this is Room Istifel Fong. Um, I should note that Istifel is the Welsh word for room and Fong is the Vietnamese word for room. Um, this was published by Parthian Press. They are a Welsh-based publisher. And this is a collection of poetry, um, short fictional pieces, photography, um, workshop conversations, um, and they all kind of explore the idea of what it means to be queer in a specific cultural context. And in this case, those contexts would be Welsh and Vietnamese. Uh, this was published with the support of British Council Wales. And it's the result of six writers, uh, three of whom were from Wales, three from Vietnam, coming together to discuss what it means to be queer uh, within their cultures. There's some really gorgeous exploration of language here. Um, there's um, a young lesbian poet who um, is talking about, she asks the question, how do you define yourself uh, when your language doesn't have a word for who you are? Um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, there's not a Welsh 
word for that. Um, there's also some really interesting bilingual text in both Vietnamese and Welsh that supplement the English language. And I don't know, I think it's interesting to look at how many vowels um, Welsh can fit into a word. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is this is one of those weird little books that I just really enjoy. It was a very quick read. You can read it in one sitting. Um, and there's just some really cool stuff in here. There's one piece that explores um, like finding queer precedents and cultural traditions. Uh, this Vietnamese author is talking about like relating the Vietnamese Hao Dong ritual, which is um, a ritual that celebrates the mother goddess um, and, and worships her. Um, and he finds sort of parallels to voguing. And he also provides a brief glossary um, where he relates Vietnamese phrases that would you would commonly hear within this ritual to the language of ballroom culture. Um, so I, I just really enjoyed this. Uh, this is, like I said, a weird little book that is just a lot of fun. I like the cover on this one. <laughs> yeah, I like that little cat looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so War Torn is one of my recommendations from Book Hug Press, and they also did Disobedience, which Travis talked about earlier. And War Torn is a book of poetry from an Iraqi Canadian author. And so in this book, he talks... Um, about what it the intersection he looks at the intersection between his Muslim faith his identity as a gay man what it's like to be Iraqi and Canadian and kind of the intersection of all of these different identities and how he can try to hold all of them together so this book of poetry um, did win a 2020 Stonewall Honor Award and as you read it they are just these like brutal visceral punches as he just like he dives in he doesn't hold anything back but looking at all of this examination of the ways these identities conflict and really the ways in which they sometimes just come up against each other in uncomfortable ways but it is a really good examination of his life um, and these different pieces of himself that he is trying to pull together This was one of mine, uh, We Can Do Better Than This, um, which I think is probably one of the truer titles I've seen in a while. But uh, this one is a collection of 35 voices ranging from, uh, I should clarify even further, a range of 35 queer voices ranging from activists to actors, writers and performers. Uh, artists and academics, and they're all touching on the idea of if you could change something to make life better for LGBTQ plus people, what would it be? And what are some of your ideas for getting there? So what I really like about this book is it serves as a reminder that yes, why we are seeing maybe, you know, examples of more inclusion, more equality, more diversity, um, still by and large around the world and right here in the US, um, LGBTQ plus people are still suffering discrimination and unfortunately in some cases uh, extreme violence or at least the insidiousness of never really feeling safe in certain public spaces. So this book is looking at how do we solve these problems and how do we help people have the opportunity to thrive so we can start to see a better future. Um, the the books, um, the, the voices in this book are kind of touching on key um, themes. So for example, we have authors writing about safety and um, what that looks like currently and how it could be better. Um, one, actually, one of these stories in the safety kind of jumped out at me. Um, Pablo Vitar, who is a, uh, a well-known in Brazil uh, drag queen, they were telling the story about how 
their um, persona, their drag queen persona doesn't, they've sort of been hiding that person away because they had been attacked on the, the street, not far from their own home. So kind of trying to, to take ownership back of a vital piece of their identity that just, they didn't feel safe sharing anymore. Uh, so like, that's the, I, you know, these are again, very personal, real stories um, from all of these contributors. Um, but, and again, the themes are safety, um, visibility. So speaking to, again, that representation, um, the need to be seen and heard. Um, it also touches on dating and love and family. It looks at health and social care and, and then beyond the binary as well as community and organizing. The other thing that I really like about this book, which you can see right here in this quote on the banner, um, is this book is a roadmap, essentially, or I can see it as a roadmap um, for anyone who wants to try to make the world a little bit better, a little bit safer, a little bit more uh, inclusive. So while this is written by um, queer voices, and certainly that would be a big part of the audience. Really, this is for, you know, any reader, any ally who's looking to see, learn more about real experiences and what they can do to show up. And again, the idea of we can do better than this. So I think this is just a really, really strong, a strong entry. All right, Dream Rooms is by a non-binary transgender author from Canada. It is described as part essay, part poem, part fever dream journal entry. And, and there are a lot of parts of this that do very much read like a fever dream, which was fantastic as you go through. But this is the author's story. They are pieces of nonfiction that are both vignettes from the author's life and also selections of poetry that kind of border on nonfiction poetry, um, kind of looking at the author's life. But it is all about revolution. And the author says, when I, when I think of revolution, I imagine it as a series of small, courageous, flawed attempts to risk everything. And so in this, um, in this novel, as you're going through all these different pieces, you really see the author's small acts of revolution, of claiming their identity, of deciding to do things like um, go out on dates with different people, uh, decide to decolonize their bookshelf, and every kind of piece just kind of builds into their identity at the end of learning who they are and being comfortable in their skin. And so this one really covers life in all of its chaos, kind of interwoven with the, interwoven with the author exploring their identity but grounded really well in just the tiniest of details that just really suck you in as you are reading these like journal entries about a rabbit named Frog that she took care that they took care of, um, but making you kind of really care and being sucked in. Okay, this is How Do I Sexy from Thorn Apple Press. Uh, this is a self-help book specifically aimed at queer, trans, and non-binary people navigating issues of desirability uh, relating to gender dysphoria, uh, specifically in a society that is often misogynistic, transphobic, um, and homophobic and pressures you, um, pressures people to conform to specific ideals. The focus here is on connecting with yourself and connecting with your community. Uh, the author, Nilan Lohr, <laughs> it's kind of a tongue twister. Nilan Lohr uh, takes a non judgmental, no shame approach, and they encourage readers to explore what they find sexy and then to apply it to themselves. Um, the author is a queer, trans, disabled advocate and educator. They bring years of their own personal experience to bear on this topic. They do not shy away from discussions that many authors might not engage with. Um, and as I mentioned, this is published by Thornapple. 
They're well known as the publishers of Polysecure and Polywise, but they also um, publish a lot of other books that focus on non-traditional relationships. Um, this book includes a wealth of healthful information. There's um, incredibly comprehensive glossary at the end, um, along with some resources for readers to do further research. Um, and I would say this is ideal for anyone new to gender transition or exploration, um, as well as anyone who might be struggling to connect with feelings of their own sexiness. And I love the little like feet at the bottom. <laughs> All right, We Set the Night on Fire is a memoir from Martha, she Martha Shelley, who, among many other things, was one of the founders of the Gay Liberation Front. And this memoir really covers, like, all of her life. It, it goes from in the beginning when she was a child growing up in Brooklyn and what things were like growing up as a child, how, you know, the ways in which she was realizing that she was a little different from everybody around her and going up through her exploration and finding different jobs and the way in which she walked by a riot one day and thought, oh, it's just another demonstration for the Vietnam War. And it was the Stonewall riots. And so immediately after that, you know, she went back and said, we need to organize a march. And that became one of the first pride parades. And so this has a really great conversational voice as you go throughout. It, they're nice little like short snippets of stories that cover both her life and her life as an activist and the ways in which those intersect. And she is someone who has just lived a very full life and every story is just full of pieces of history, people she met, just wild things she did. And it sounds the whole time like someone is just sitting there kind of reading this book out loud to you with the way she's talking conversationally. So it's a great like, on the one hand, a very fun read as you go through to hear her voice and her stories, but also just a super touching and informative memoir of the early gay rights movement. Okay, this one is mine. This is Screen Age by Fenton Bailey. Um, Fenton Bailey is likely a name that you are not familiar with or have heard, um, but he's been instrumental in shaping queer culture for the past 40 plus years, and I would say just culture in general. Um, along with his partner, Randy Barbado, he founded World of Wonder Productions, and together they have produced numerous um, films, documentaries, TV shows, um, like really everything. Um, his credits include Party Monster, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Monica in Black and White, which was a documentary on Monica Lewinsky, the TV series Becoming Chaz, which focused on Chaz Bono, uh, Maplethorpe, Look at the Pictures, uh, Wishful Drinking with Carrie Fisher. Um, the, he also produced a documentary on the Statue of Liberty. Um, but he's most famously known as the co-creator and producer of a little show called RuPaul's Drag Race. He is still a producer on that uh, series. Um, and this is his memoir, uh, but it's also his manifesto of... Um, sort of screen culture. Um, and it's also a cultural history of gay New York in the 80s and 90s and, and LA uh, during the 2000s up until today. Um, each chapter that he writes focuses on a film or TV project that he worked on. Um, but it goes a little bit further than that because he takes those projects um, as a jumping off point to discuss larger cultural and historical issues. There's just a ton of behind the scenes stories um, about RuPaul before he was famous. Um, he says he has not changed much. He's always kind of been the same person. Um, stories about Tammy Faye Messner, Cher, Britney Spears, uh, many, many more. Um, 
Bailey was hugely influenced and indebted to Andy Warhol. There's a lot of discussions about his impact on uh, on Bailey and on our culture at large. Um, he has a lot of polarizing opinions. Um, I did not agree with all, everything that he had to say, um, but every assessment that he makes, um, I just really enjoyed his take on a lot of things. Um, I would say this is perfect for fans of Drag Race, queer art, pop culture um, and gay history uh, from the 1980s through today. He's also really funny. And that's me. age. Okay, uh, moving into our um, young adult and children's titles. Um, I wanted to share with you all the complicated calculus and cows of Carl Paulson. Uh, I really loved this book. Um, it's a young adult fiction, so ages 12 and up, and I, I would maybe skew that up just a touch more, um, say 14 or 15 and up. Um, the It's a short, a relatively short uh, book, quick read, um, but it's just so, so so very real and i absolutely fell in love with carl i think anyone who reads this would um carl is a sophomore in a uh, rural town not too far from minneapolis um he's dealing with he feels like an outsider for lots of reasons uh one because um his mother recently passed away um, only just two years ago. So his family is still kind of coming back from the grief of that. Um, he is aware that um, their small dairy farm is having some financial troubles and he's kind of feeling disconnected from his dad on that because he wants to help, but feels like it's this constant struggle. Um and then he's also, he's, he's gay and he's pretty sure he might be the only gay kid, um, in his school. And so he's dealing with all of that. And then in walks new kid, Andy Olman and Carl, um, is a little bit kind of struck at, at love at first sight. And just, I think it brings back any memory of, you know, being in high school and, you know, thinking things like, oh, well, my name, my last name starts with a P and his last name starts with an O. So we'll probably sit together in class if we're seated alphabetically. And what if we're set up as lab partners? And then that crushing feeling of, oh, no, we're not set up as lab partners. Um, so it, it's a lot of that sort of innocent rush of that sort of first really big crush, maybe even first really big love. Um, and Carl's kind of wondering, you know, does Andy feel the same way? Does he not? And I will say this book is a little, um, at times, heartbreaking, a little crushing sometimes. I uh, I know I choked up at more than once, which is not something I, I regularly do. Um, but it was... I don't know. Again, I, it just comes back to me as it just feels very real. It feels, it feels very lived in and I am, it, it, you know, very much rooting for Carl. So I, I think this is a, I just, I could not recommend this one highly enough. Okay, this next one's mine. This is Tim Tamaru and the Subterranean Heartsick Blues. This was a uh, top shelf title from us last spring, and this is a queer YA romanticy with an enemies to lovers trope. Um, it's set at Fox Glacier High School for the Magically Adept. This is a magical boarding school underneath a glacier in New Zealand. Um, and the story follows Tim, Tim Tamaro. Um, he's dumped by his girlfriend and decides to pair up on a class project with frenemy Elliot Parker, who was also just dumped by his boyfriend. Um, T Elliot's ex is now dating Tim's ex-girlfriend. So they partner up on this school project to raise a magical egg together. 
so that they'll make their exes jealous. Um, they agree to be friends with benefits for the duration of the project, but they end up, of course, developing feelings for each other. Um, what I love about this is there's a really strong diversity uh, representation. Uh, Tim is biracial, he's white and Maori, um, just like the author of this book, H.S. Valley. Um, the magic that's taught at this school is deeply rooted in Maori culture, which I think is a really interesting um, uh, approach to that. Um, and there's a really honest portrayal of Tim questioning and exploring his bisexuality. Uh, this has been described as red, white, and royal blue meets the magicians uh, with really strong comps to Rainbow Rowell and David Levithan. Um, this, like, I've found so many reviews of this book uh, online with people who just really connect with this title. Um, they really love this. It's charming, it's cozy, it's funny, and it has a really big heart. So Short Stuff is one of mine. Um, I adored this collection of short stories. Um, I say short stories, but there's four in here. So each one is, you know, like a, there's several chapters for each story, um, but they are all queer meet cutes. So the characters are, all, all the main characters are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. And it is four different ways in which they all meet each other in adorable and heartbending ways. And so the first one, you have a Olympic swimmer who has a enemies to lovers relationship with the chef who cooks them all the food at the pool. You have two boys on vacation at the beach who meet, fall in love, but they're headed off to college. So you don't know where it's headed between them. You have um, love in the time of coffee, which was inspired by love in the time of cholera about you know one girl being in love with her best friend for their whole lives and you know finally in college they realize that they're in love with each other and the last story is the outlier that i greatly enjoyed where you have one girl who wants to be a warrior maiden and marches off to go slay the dragon who turns out to be a shape-shifting girl um, and the two of them get their own little happy ending so these are all adorable hopeful stories and it is meant to help, you know, queer teens see that like you, they also can have their own neat cutes and all of them are just full of love and acceptance. And you will just kind of feel like, oh, every time you read one of the stories. So they're lots of fun. Um, it is uh, for teens and it very, it's very clean. So like it can easily go to lower teenagers um, would be totally fine reading this. And each of the authors in here also have full length novels that are published by Interlude Press as well. So there's more of their writing that's out there. Um, but I love this, it's all queer authors and very fun YA title. I'm gonna jump in just for a second. I was noticing the time. Um, it looks, we have a few more titles for you all. It looks like we might run just slightly over our one hour runtime. Um, we hope you can all stick with us, but if not, we completely understand and just know that this is being recorded and we will be sharing the recording with you in our June news newsletter. So just wanted to mention that as I'm looking at the clock, tick tocking away. <laughs> um, all right, uh, this one is a different kind of Brave by Lee Wind. Uh, this one is, a action adventure slash romance um, of uh, two boys, uh, Nico and, uh, oh shoot, sorry, um, uh, Nico and uh, Sam. Um, it's been described as heart sta Heartstopper meets James Bond. And it is definitely an adventure. Uh, it's, um, it's almost set up like a James Bond uh, story or sort of spy thriller, if you will. Um, the book starts off with Nico, who is in a sort of a religious conversion therapy institute um, that's run by Dr. H. And Nico manages to escape and um, 
comes across Sam, who is uh, lives a more privileged life on the Upper West Side, and Sam idolizes James Bond. And while he's kind of recovering from a, heart, a broken heart, he vows that like like Bond, he's never going to trust in love again. But then, of course, along comes Nico, and you know things become like, oh well, maybe I could be in love again. Um, Nico and Sam decide that they're going to go back to the Institute and kind of break out the others who are still uh, imprisoned there. I mean, I think that is actually the correct word in terms of how the book presents it. Um, lots of drama, lots of thrills. It is very romantic too. Um, it's, uh, you know, you can see some nice reviews from book, lo book list and forward and Kirkus. Um, I think I, what I guess I like about this is I don't know that there are many books like this right now or perhaps ever um, where it's again this YA um, romance between two uh, young men and then also this spy thriller adventure element as well the book in the end also does a, like a few jumps into the future which i also liked because you kind of see where everyone ends up so i think this is a really fun one and would definitely be um a unique uh hand cell to have at the ready Okay, this is Gay and Lesbian History for Kids from Chicago Review Press. Uh, and this is a comprehensive overview of LGBTQ plus history, focusing on the 20th and 21st century struggles for equal rights. Um, I love this book because there's just so much information included in here. Um, there's these great um, thumbnail sketches of key figures known as like, I think they're called gay heroes in this, um, who have helped shape queer culture, uh, including Gertrude Stein, Alan Turing, Lorraine Hansberry, Harvey Milk, Christine Jorgensen, Maurice Sendak, and Sir Ian McKellen. And it also covers key historical events in the struggle for equal rights, um, including the Daughters of Belitis and the Mattachine Society. These were two early um, queer uh, organizations. It covers the Stonewall Riots, um, uh, the AIDS crisis, ACT UPS, activism, fighting government um, sort of in action, and fights for marriage equality and queer liberation. Uh, but it also includes activities. I think there's 21 different activities for young readers uh, to continue their exploration of history on their own. Um, some of these include suggestions for writing free verse poems in the style of Walt Whitman, uh, designing a flag like the rainbow flag uh, created by Gilbert Baker, uh, researching different boycotts that have happened, um, and inventing a new language inspired by Polari. Um, as I mentioned, this is a comprehensive history. It's easily accessible. And this is perfect for families who want to educate their children on LGBTQ history and culture. OK. Uh, this one is one of mine. Um, my shadow is purple. Um, this one might be very familiar to you already. Um, it definitely was in the news quite a bit last year um, when a teacher read it in her classroom and then was later fired for doing so. Um, but this is um, Scott Stewart is also the author of uh, My Shadow is Pink. Um, but this one is My Shadow is Purple. And it's a heartwarming and really just easy, um, affirming book about being true to yourself and moving beyond uh, the gender binary. Um, it's, you know, it's got the, um, personally, I think this one's a little stronger than My Shadow is Peak in terms of, of the, the rhyme scheme and the readability of it. Um, I really like how it's, it's again that reaffirming of it's okay to be you um you know i like this line where you know some of my friends think i'm simply confused because sometimes i like boy things and sometimes i like quote unquote girl things but 
it gets into how all of these things can kind of blend together and gender roles and gender norms aren't always what they seem um, and don't necessarily have to be these static forms of identity. Um, it is a picture book. So this is kind of, you know, for ages, maybe, th you know, three to five, um, somewhere in that range, but could go older into like first and second grade um, and early elementary as well. Um, this book, um, we, I will again say, I'm sorry to say we are out of stock currently, but it is on order with the publisher and we expect to have more sooner than later. But I also just wanted to share too, I think this book in particular, um, I, I had this on our table at New Voices, New Rooms last year and um, a woman walked by and this the book caught her eye. And she was honestly moved to tears because it was something that her own family was um, experiencing with um, her son. And just, I think it reaffirmed all of the support and love she was trying to show her son. And I think to the larger point, I think we all know this, but representation matters. And I think what we're, you know, this list as a whole, I think are, really good um, titles and examples just to show, to make, help people feel seen and find something that they can relate to. And again, that representation is so important. Um, so this is My Shadow is Purple. And I think that is our last one. So I'm going to stop sharing our Edelweiss collection and just pop up our PowerPoint one last time. And here we go. Okay, so just a brief reminder that we do have these summer specials. Um, these do need to be orders that are going directly through your rep. Um, again, we'll help kind of cater your orders to take advantage of these specials, um, but they are available if you haven't already used them, but we can talk about that more with your rep. And we very much hope that you can join us for our next session, uh, Summer Escapism. And our next session will be on Wednesday, June 26th at 2 p.m. Central. And we'll be featuring fun titles that all, you know, just say summer in one way or another. So summer romance, travel, beach reads, all about summer escape. And lastly, um, well, I, I should check, I guess, were, are there any questions in the chat that we still need to touch to cover? The chat is good, I think. Perfect. Well, again, thank you all so much for, for joining us. We do really appreciate it. Uh, we love the chance to, to share with you all titles we're excited about or titles that, you know, maybe backlist titles that we feel maybe got overlooked a little bit for whatever reason. So again, we do really so much appreciate your time. And on the screen, you should be able to see all of our contact info, as well as our handles for Instagram as well. So if there's nothing else, we'll say thank you and goodbye.